Welcome to Washington's Legal Foundation's midterm briefing. My name is Glenn Lamy. I'm executive director and vice president of legal studies here at Washington Legal Foundation. We're very pleased to have you join us today. As we have for over four decades, WLF has been very active uh, in the Supreme Court this term as an amicus. We filed merits briefs in five cases that have already been argued, two in cases that will be argued in March and are likely to file in one that's yet to be scheduled. WLF also supported a number of certiorari petitions on which the justices will likely act in the next month or so. The pending cases that our speakers will talk about today implicate major statutory and constitutional questions that impact such areas of law as private securities litigation, class action certification, standing to sue, the appointments clause, and antitrust. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let me introduce our panelists. Before doing that, though, I do, do want to note that this program is being recorded, and if you have any questions, please, uh, or if you want to send a message to me during the program, there's a chat box to the right of the video screens, and please feel free to send those questions in, and we'll ask them as we get to things. So uh, our first, first, I'll introduce Archis Parasharabi, who's a litigation partner at Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office, where he's also co-chair of the Consumer Litigation and Class Actions Practice, and is also a member of the firm's Supreme Court and Appellate Practice. Along with two colleagues, he prepared an amicus brief for the Chamber of Commerce of the United States of America and TransUnion versus Ramirez in both the cert and the merit stage. We also have with us today Mark Davies, who is co-chair of Oric L LLP's nationwide Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group. His practice focuses on litigation matters for technology companies, particularly ones that lead the world in hardware and software innovation. He's the counsel of record on an amicus brief filed on behalf of Apple in U.S. versus Arthex and on a brief filed on behalf of former student athletes in NCAA versus Alston. Finally, we're joined by Lyle Roberts, who's a partner with Sherman and Sterling in the firm's litigation practice. Lyle represents companies, officers, directors in securities cases and SEC enforcement matters throughout the United States. He was counsel of record on two amicus briefs WL filed in the Goldman Sachs versus Arkansas case, one at the search stage and one on the merits. So I'll get us started off here by asking a general question to our panelists, which is, do you have anything, and are there any takeaways so far from the decisions that have come down or the oral arguments that, that have been done that you might want to share with our, with our audience? Mark, do you, are you, do you want to talk about, we, we were chatting a little bit before this, and, and one of the things that Mark uh, talked about that was interesting to me was the was the way that oral arguments have been shaking out in this new environment, and and I, you know I, I think that that might be an interesting place to start. But we still don't have Mark's audio, unfortunately. Uh, oh, we don't have the sound. Um, well, Mark, while, while we're hearing your sound, maybe uh, you know, and, and hop back in as soon as it comes back. But uh, I'll make an observation which is, you know, I, I've been looking at business cases um, uh, that affect issues like class actions and, and, uh, and other uh, uh, issues of importance to, to business. Um, uh, there, were, uh, there are three cases I'm watching. Uh, there had been a fourth, but it was dismissed as improvidently granted. I feel like it's too soon to say how the term will shake out for business, but one thing is clear to me already is that I think there had been a prediction that the court was going to be fairly reflexively pro-business. And at least from the questions that have been asked at the oral arguments that I've been watching, I don't think that that's, that's necessarily the case. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and, and the only data point we have definitively so far is that in, in one case involving the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, kind of an arcane issue, but one that, that where there was an expectation that the court would go a certain way, it ended up dismissing the cases improvidently granted. And we don't know why that happens, but uh, but I, I guess it tells you that it was not an immediate win delivered for the business side. So so that was the the one uh, piece of information we have in what seems like so far we're still pretty early to to make judgments. Mm. Sorry, Mark, we're still not hearing you. Uh, you may want to give a try to the to the phone in number. Um, so. Archis, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the uh, the, the TransUnion case. Um, why is that a, a big one for us to, to be paying attention to? Sure, and you know, I'll try to provide some background on it. I hope it's not too much background, but I think the facts are important. I, I mean, to your question, Glenn, it's I think it's a really big deal. Uh, it's going to be argued on March 30th. 
it, it is easily the most important class action case of this term, but that's in part because there aren't a lot of class action cases this term. Um, but more important, I think it could be the most significant class action case in the court in let's say the last four to five years uh, since Tyson Foods and Spokia were decided in 2016. That explains the, this pile, virtual pile of amicus briefs that arrived in the court on Monday. Uh, I think there were 11 briefs. Uh, Gwen uh, filed one for the Washington Legal Foundation. We filed a brief for the Chamber of Commerce and the uh, NFIB, and uh, and you know we, we were not alone. Um, and I think you know the the briefs. Uh, these briefs focused on two key issues. One relating to uh, typicality under Rule 23 for purposes of class certification. And the second is the interaction of Article 3's standing requirement and specifically the requirement that there be injury in fact uh, in order to, to bring a claim in federal court, uh, how that plays into Rule 23. How does that get applied across the, the board? And so I think the facts are important here for in, to understand both questions. So I'll talk about this briefly. I'll try uh, not to get into too much detail, but tr TransUnion offered a product to help businesses comply with their obligations not to enter into uh, transactions with people on the on the OFAC list. OFAC, I I've learned, stands for the Office of Foreign Assets Control, and the individuals on this OFAC list include, uh, you know, uh, according to OFAC, known terrorists, narcotics traffickers, and we'll put it this way, it's not a terrific list to be on. Um, so, uh, you know, the businesses will look at this, will, will make use of uh, TransUnion's product to see if, if they're uh, entering into a potentially prohibited transaction. The, TransUnion, TransUnion made clear in its brief, and I think this is a fair point, that it had expressed disclaimers that its product was not the end-all be-all, it was a starting point, and that businesses should go do more. Uh, it turns out not every business does, does further digging and sometimes just relies reflexively on the list. And that's what happened to this name plaintiff, Sergio Ramirez. Uh, in 2011, because this case has been around for 10 years, uh, or at least the facts that led to the case have been around for 10 years, um, Mr. Ramirez went with his wife and his father-in-law to buy a car. Uh, at, at, and when he got to the dealership and they looked into his background uh, through, through this TransUnion report, he was listed as a match to a name on the OFAC list. It was not a real match, uh, but uh, the dealership refused to sell Ramirez the car, instead saying that the car had to be put in, in his wife's name. I, you know, uh, as a human being stepping back, uh, you know, if I were in his shoes, uh, you know, certainly didn't. This is how he testified. He was understandably embarrassed uh, in front of his wife and his father-in-law, kind of in the same way as if I was out to dinner with my, my wife and uh, her parents and my credit card were declined. That would be very embarrassing. This seems worse. Uh, and uh, so understandably, th this person felt aggrieved, had a claim. He checked with TransUnion, asked for his credit file. He was sent a copy of his credit file along with a summary of the rights that uh, this summary is a summary that's required under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. He was also sent a separate letter mentioning that his name appeared as a potential match to the OFAC list, but this letter did not come with a summary of rights. Uh, and uh, after getting this letter, he canceled the vacation to Mexico because he was concerned about the OFAC alert. Uh, you know, uh, uh, also understandable, but but a quite a quite a serious situation uh, for Mr. Ramirez. He filed a class action. He included two claims under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. One was for a failure to maintain reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy of the information about him when preparing a consumer report. Uh, essentially, the, 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 uh, pointing to the error uh, on, on the OFAC list issue. And second, for violation of disclosure requirements, because the information that was required to be sent arrived in two separate envelopes, basically. I, I'm caricaturing it a little bit. I'm sure he would, he, or his lawyers would phrase it differently. But in sum, the information that he was entitled to receive was in fact all received uh, just in separate mailings because of the way that TransUnion systems work. Eventually, a class was certified and the case went to trial with Ramirez as the class representative. The jury heard about Ramirez's unfortunate experience, more than unfortunate experience, at the car dealership. Uh, but there was no evidence about similar harms to anyone else. And in fact, most of the class was not harmed in the same way. Uh, th these are, to me, kind of critical points to understanding the standing and typicality issues. 
75% of the class, there were about 8,000 people in the class, over 6,000 of them who received the same kind of letter as Ramirez, uh, never had information about them disseminated to third parties. So it was like a tree falling in the forest, but no one, no one was there to, to read it. Um, and then for the remaining uh, 1,800 class members who did have information disseminated, no evidence was introduced about whether they had suffered an adverse action, such as the inability to, to, to buy the car that, that Ramirez faced. Nonetheless, uh, and here I'm extrapolating, but, but bank, I assume banking on, on the, the understandably tough story that Mr. Ramirez told, uh, the jury awarded statutory damages of just under $1,000 a person. $1,000 is the maximum. It was something like $980-something per person. And punitive damages of over $6,300 a person for a total verdict of $60 million. Uh, on appeal, the Ninth Circuit uh, reduced the punitive damages in half. That part, that the court did not accept review, the, the Supreme Court did not accept review of the punitive damages question. Um, but... Uh, it, it, on the parts that do matter to the Supreme Court case coming up, uh, it, it uh, one, accepted the notion that every class member, when it gets to final judgment, must have Article Three standing to recover money damages in federal court, which was, which was a good part of the opinion. But then it went on to say that, in fact, every class member did have standing. Uh, for two reasons. It concluded that the absence of uh, the summary of rights provided with the OFAC letter created standing, even though the credit report sent along in a separate but contemporaneous uh, mailing had a summary of rights. It, it concluded that people might be confused, and that was good enough. Um, and then it concluded that there was a material risk of harm to all class members uh, because of the inclusion of this erroneous information on credit reports, even if the reports were never disseminated to anyone else. Uh, and then uh, as to typicality, the court concluded that even though Ramirez had different facts, his legal theory was the same as the one advanced on behalf of other class members. And so he was not too atypical to serve uh, uh, as, the, as a class representative. There was a pretty spirited dissent on, on this point. Um, so now the case is in the Supreme Court and the court you know, it granted on one question, the question kind of packs a lot in. It asks both whether Rule 23 and Article 3 principles were violated by the, the class certification in this case. Uh, and what we have argued in our amicus brief, tracking the arguments made on the merits and tracking what has been made in some form or another in, in the various amicus, other amicus briefs, is that one, most of the absent class members in fact lacked Article III standing to sue, so should not have been part of a, a certified class, and that class certification was therefore improper. And we argue that independently, for an independent reason, Ramirez was an atypical class representative because his facts were so different from those of other class members. We urge the court to hold definitively, as Chief Justice Roberts has previously stated in his concurrence in Tyson Foods, and as the Ninth Circuit recognized, that Article III prohibits the federal courts from ordering relief to persons who lack standing, uh, class action or not. Um, and so uh, let me stop there, because now I think, I think we're at the point of the, you know, uh, uh, what the court is poised to do. Um, and, and I mean, I think it would be interesting to discuss uh, what, what folks think about uh, this case, but I'll just summarize that, you know, our, our basic view is that the kinds of harms that, that are pleaded, not by Ramirez himself. Ramirez is, you know, I, I think you can tell I'm sympathetic. The jury was sympathetic. There are very few people who wouldn't be sympathetic to Ramirez's situation. But uh, let me actually flip that. And as to typicality, that's the point, is that he's really sympathetic. He'd make a terrific plaintiff in an individual case, uh, as, you know, speaking as a litigator. Uh, but he is not the same as the 8,000 other people who you know, did not have any of these things happen to them as far as we know. And, and we know for a fact, it was undisputed that three fourths of them, you know, the, the class didn't even have their information submitted to anyone else. So, so you know, the, the, the nature of the harms, the alleged harms was quite different. And then if you look at standing, it seems like for the majority of the class, the, sta the standing claims were kind of like the ones that were at issue in the Spokio case, which we litigated some years ago, which is to say, I, I, a colleague actually just, just used this phrase the other day, which I, I like, foot faults. That, were, were there you know, alleged errors uh, uh, by the company that, that you know, allegedly violated the statute? That, that, is, that was uh, the way that the case came up. But were, were these uh, mistakes ones that caused any real harm, real is the phrase the Supreme Court used in Spokio, concrete harm, 
uh, that went above and beyond the violation of the statute, it's hard to see how that's the case. And just to take the dissemination point, you know, it's, it's long been understood that in the law of defamation, uh, it, making a statement that no one hears doesn't count as defamation. And, and the common law is supposed to inform how we think about uh, Article Three standing. And so it, it just seems to me that if a credit report was never given to anyone, uh, how can there be harm? Now, I've gone on a lot. I, I think that the uh, the facts are pretty interesting here, and they, you know, to my to my mind, the, these pretty uh, you know outlier facts with respect to the name plaintiff should drive the analysis. Um, and it'll be interesting to see which way the court goes uh, on this in terms of Article Three standing or Rule Twenty Three. Do you have any any intuition as to which way they might go one way or the other on 23 or, or Article 3? Well, I think it's hard to say, but I, the one thing I think is clear is that Rule 23 is implicated no matter what, because the way in which standing meaningfully comes into this case is, is uh, either uh, uh, because um, uh, standing uh, uh, affects how the class was defined or it affects um, uh, questions of predominance. So, uh, you know, just kind of, uh, kind of uh, thinking, thinking out loud here. Uh, we think that a class definition can't kind of predictably include large numbers of people, or really non-trivial numbers of people, for whom there's no standing. So that's a class definition problem there with respect to standing. And we also think that there has to be a plan. Uh, to weed out people who, la who lack standing, if there are individualized inquiries necessary, then we think the predominance requirement fails. And so those are the ways in which Article 3 gets plugged into the Rule 23 analysis. And so, you know, if they, I guess what I would say is they will almost certainly rule on Rule 23. I think the typicality uh, issue is sort of easy to see. And uh, the standing one requires more work, but I think it's pretty clear that uh, Article Three principles are implicated in, in the Rule 23 analysis. So do you expect a, a decision from the court that will sweep broader than just the Fair Credit Reporting Act as, as similar to like the Lujan case did with, with environmental standing and the larger issue of standing? You know, I, I think it I think it will. I think that the principles that are announced if, if the court reaches the question of which it should because it has, you know, it's tied up in jurisdiction, right? Uh, the question of uh, Article 3 standing, uh, it will articulate more detailed answers than we've received in the past, than we received in Spokio, than we received in, you know, there have been two other cases, Frank versus Gaos and, uh, and the Thole case, which involves uh, ERISA. I, I think you know, FICRA litigation is, is common, but uh, the same kinds of issues that come up for FICRA come up in a bunch of other places. A brief by the Retail Litigation Center points to the similarities between the kinds of claims here and claims that arise under the TCPA. I, I would also say that, you know, post Spokio, which gave a lot of information, but didn't go all the way in addressing standing in part because Justice Scalia passed away after argument, but before the decision. So I think that, you know, I think it's fair to say there were some compromise elements to the opinion in Spokio. But as a result, the lower courts are in disarray on standing. And so this is a, a real opportunity for the Supreme Court to provide some guidance and help harmonize the law. I mean, certainly the fact that Facebook and other companies filed their own amicus brief, which is pretty rare, I think is, a, is an indication of how important this case is and how broadly it might sweep. What were your thoughts on the Solicitor General's brief? Yeah, I, I thought it was a very interesting brief. Um, you know, I uh, I think that uh, the one thing that I commend the the SG's office for is is its uh, very fair treatment of typicality. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I think that the you know the, they uh, the, the brief expresses real concern about the class certification based on typicality. Now, I, I don't agree with the, the standing approach, and I think it can be distinguished with uh, the prior administration's brief filed in the Frank versus Gaos case, where even though the issue presented was not one related to standing, the SG's office thought it was important to, to raise the question of standing. And here, you know, I, I think that, uh, well, two points. One, one is that I think, I think it is telling that, that the brief you know, also jo joined by the CFPB, uh, has has a pretty uh, full-throated defense of standing under FICRA for these what I call footfalls. Um, and then on the on the merits of what they've argued, I think 
my own view is that it's a stretch that, you know, for, for people who haven't had information actually disseminated about them, uh, you know, to my mind, the, the, the big question is then you can also, you can have actual harm or, or imminent harm is what the Supreme Court has said. If you, you know, you can sue over potential future harms, but the Supreme Court said in Clapper that the future harms have to be quote unquote, certainly impending, which is a high standard, I think, uh, you know, uh, 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 I think, I think to prove certainly impending seems like quite a bit more than maybe, or it's speculative. And I, I read the uh, the SG's brief as as adopting a lower standard than certainly impending, at least in practice. So you know whether the court, the Supreme Court, accepts that remains to be seen. But you know, I guess I I would say there's the precedent suggests that it shouldn't. Lyle, Mark, any questions for Archie's on the TransUnion case? The, the only thing I would say, uh, Glenn and, and Archie's is. It, it, are there other fact patterns that are kind of out there, floating out there, where this would has already kind of shown up as a as a problem beyond the the fact pattern here with our our poor um, car buyer. Well, I, I guess what I would say as somebody who does a lot of class action defense is that plaintiffs lawyers are smart, worthy adversaries, and they look for uh, plaintiffs who uh, who have very sympathetic stories. That's understandable. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm not a trial lawyer by trade, but like I, you know, I hang out with them, right? And and they try to win cases before juries. That's their goal. So the smart plaintiffs lawyers pick someone from the start who is sympathetic to the extent that they're able to pick and choose, and often they're able to pick and choose. And so we have lots of cases out there, reported cases, cases that that we work on. I'm sure cases that your your firm works on, where when you look at the name plaintiff, you might say, "Gosh, what happened to them? Isn't that great?" But are they really uh, representative of the, this group at a, as a whole? And I think more often than not, the answer is no. Uh, so, so I think it's a very common issue when it, you know, both with respect to typicality and standing. Okay, well, I guess we'll, we'll move on to the Goldman Sachs case, which, uh, as I noted at the outset, uh, WLF filed on the search stage and on the merit stage. We were thrilled and honored to have by Roberts to our brief in both of those instances. So Lyle, if you could tell us a little bit about that case and, and uh, sort of where it fits in to the court's jurisprudence on securities fraud litigation. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, so, you know, Arjus said that uh, TransUnion is, you know, the most important uh, class action case uh, in front of this Supreme Court right now. And I, I don't disagree with that, but I'll disagree with it just to the slight bit, which is that the Goldman case, which is about securities class actions um, is very important for our you know, small corner of the law uh, when it comes to securities litigation. And let me, before I kind of dive into the case itself, it might be helpful to set the stage by taking a few minutes to lay out what's a securities class action and why does it matter whether we have more or less securities class actions. So uh, a typical securities class action is brought on behalf of investors who purchase a company's stock in reliance on corporate misstatements. So the investors are alleging that they purchased their shares at a price that was artificially inflated by the misstatements and then were damaged when the truth about the corporate misstatements was revealed to the market and you have a subsequent stock price drop. So these cases are brought as class actions because it's rare that an individual defendant has sufficient damages to justify bringing a case on its own. But that also means that security at class actions are largely lawyer driven. Um, because they're really only economical when they're brought on behalf of a class. So there is a set of plaintiff's firms that actively recruit investors to act as representative plaintiffs, and then they pursue these cases uh, almost entirely on a contingency basis. And it's important to understand that there are a lot of these cases. So prior to 2020, um, when the pandemic cut down the numbers a little bit, there were roughly 400 securities class actions a year being filed every year. And that means that nearly 10% of all companies trading on US listed exchanges are sued in a securities class action in any given year. So that's a pretty, I think, stunning percentage and shows you kind of the corporate risk that's inherent in securities litigation. And as the number of these cases have increased, really the underlying rationale for them has also started to change. So, um, Typically in the past, securities class actions were based on corporate financial disclosures regarding internal events. So for example, when the company would issue a financial restatement and basically tell the market, we made a mistake in how we presented ourselves uh, and our financial results to the market. 
But recently, the Plankton Spar really has been turning its focus to something else, um, which we call event-driven securities litigation. And what that means is that they're bringing cases that are based on external events that drive down a company's stock price. So, and these external events cover a wide range of possible items, things like data security breaches, sexual harassment allegations, um, commercial litigation, allegations that a product has a side effect or has caused an injury, regulatory investigations, government enforcement actions. So all sorts of things that are not the company itself sort of going out to the market and saying this bad thing happened to us, but rather something uh, that you know a third party essentially is bringing to the attention of the market and maybe causing a stock price um, drop. Um, so for example, all the major cruise lines this year have been sued in the wake of COVID-19 in securities litigation, basically for failing to adequately warn investors about the possible impact of a pandemic on their business. So why, are all, why do we have you know, 400 cases a year being brought? Well, the reason is, is that these cases are very lucrative um, for the plaintiff's bar uh, in that you know, the average settlement over the last four years, if you remove outliers for a securities class action is about $30 million a case. And cases do typically settle if plaintiffs are able to get past a motion to dismiss, uh, and especially if they're able to get a class certified by the court. So all of which uh, brings us finally to the Goldman case. Um, and, and like Arches, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the factual background because it's important, I think, to then understand the underlying uh, legal issues. So in Goldman, the plaintiffs have alleged that the company had conflicts of interest in four collateralized debt obligations, um, CDOs as, their, as the acronym for them, that it sold in 2006 and 2007. So quite some time ago now. And these conflicts of interest supposedly were revealed to the market in 2010 when investors learned that the SEC and the DOJ, uh, i.e. the federal government, were bringing investigations or actions related to the transactions. So I think what's important to understand here, though, is that Goldman never made any public statements related to the particular CDOs at issue. So what the plaintiffs alleged were the misstatements in the case were generic disclosures about Goldman's business principles and the risks of conflicts that it faced. So to give an example, one of the statements that the plaintiffs alleged was misleading to the market was integrity and honesty are at the heart of our business, quote unquote. So in essence, the plaintiffs were alleging that, plaintiff, that Goldman was required when it was making statements like that, statements like, you know, honesty is at the heart of our business, that it also needed to disclose the existence of the alleged conflicts of interest as to these four CDOs. So this is basically an event-driven case, like I've described, right? The market learned about the investigations, the stock price declined, and the plaintiffs essentially worked their way backwards to identify these more general statements that arguably had some connection to the alleged undisclosed conflicts of interest. So at issue before the Supreme Court now is the standard for reliance at class certification. So plaintiffs generally would have the burden of, of demonstrating class-wide reliance at class certification as part of showing that there are, that the questions common to the class predominate, right, over any questions affecting individual members. So in securities class actions, though, it's basically impractical, right, to show that each investor in the class relied in the same way upon the alleged statements. Uh, instead, the Supreme Court, in a case called Basic, um, said that the plaintiffs can do this by satisfying uh, a presumption of reliance. And to invoke this presumption of reliance, so it's a one that's going to apply across the class, plaintiffs have to show um, that the alleged misrepresentations were publicly known, uh, that they were material i.e. they were important to investors, that the stock traded in an efficient market, that's usually shown by showing that the, that the company trades on a, on a US listed exchange, uh, and that the plaintiff traded the stock between the time that the misrepresentations were made and when the truth uh, was revealed to the market. And all of these requirements um, are, based, are based on something called the efficient capital markets hypothesis, uh, which sort of is relevant as we're talking about it here, posits that in an efficient market, any material statements will have an impact on the stock's price. And therefore, any investor who's trading in a market like that, in an efficient market, can be presumed to have relied upon the stock's price and all public statements about the stock. So in other words, price becomes a kind of substitute for a plaintiff coming in and saying, I read the statements and relied on them. Instead, on a class-wide basis, 
um, the plaintiffs are able to come in and say all of the investors relied on the price being accurate and the price had within it uh, all of the information, the public information about the stock. But, but all of this, this basic requirement is really an indirect proxy for price impact. And that's in the Supreme Court in a case called Caliburton too, it said that so that's really the underpinning of the basic presumption that the statements had an impact on the stock's price and therefore the information was incorporated in the price class members relied upon that price, and therefore they could show reliance on a class-wide basis. So how do you establish uh, price impact? So that may be really quite straightforward when you have a false statement that causes the stock price to rise, and then the price falls when the truth comes out. So imagine a scenario like the company says, great news, we discovered gold, right? And the stock price goes up $10. And a few months later, the company comes back out to the public and it says, ah, actually, it was fool's gold. And the stock price goes down $10. Right? So there we have a really easy showing of price impact. Statement caused the price to go up. When the truth came out, the price went back down. But some courts also have recognized that a misstatement can have a price impact if it prevents a decline that would have occurred had the statement not been made or if it had been made truthfully. So in other words, now we're not talking about discover gold, price goes up. Now we're talking about the company says something, it's not truthful, but if it had been truthful, the stock price would have declined, but since it wasn't truthful, the stock price stays the same. And so this is called the price maintenance theory, and that's what the plaintiffs have alleged in Goldman. So they, they are trying to satisfy this basic presumption, have reliance for the entire class by using this price maintenance theory. So that is to say that when Goldman said things like, uh, gee, we're very honest, and we try to be very, you know, honesty is at the heart of our business, it wasn't that that raised the stock price of Goldman. In fact, experts showed the stock price didn't move at all when Goldman said things like that, but rather that it prevented the stock price from going down. So the problem in the case for the plaintiffs is that uh, Goldman had a lot of evidence that the, these alleged misstatements, these kind of generic statements, had no stock price impact, not even to the extent of maintaining the price at some existing level. And that evidence included that Goldman stock price didn't decline uh, at, when, when on a number of dates before the alleged corrective disclosures in the case, um, there was discussion in public about Goldman's alleged conflicts of interest related to CDOs. Um, it also included that the stock price didn't rise when the challenge statements were made. So again, there was no, we found gold and went up $10. Um, that the challenge statements were not the type of general, you know, aspirational statements on which investors usually rely. Um, and also that there were, they had an expert opinion that basically said that, look, the reason why the stock price dropped uh, was the news of the government enforcement activity, not new information about some kind of alleged conflicts of interest. So that's the defense side. What did the plaintiffs have? So the plaintiffs basically had a single expert report. And in that report, uh, the expert found that the stock price declines were statistically significant. So when the information came out about these investigations, um, there was a real stock price decline more than just you know, how the market moved that day. And also opining that the declines are the result of the revelation of fraudulent conduct that was related to these general statements about business goals and conflict risks. So the lower court, um, found that Goldman had not sufficiently rebutted the existence of price impact and certified the class. So Goldman had the ability to come in and say, no price impact here, and therefore a class shouldn't be certified because you cannot rely on this basic presumption. Lower report found it didn't do that sufficiently. So on appeal, and actually it was the second appeal on this, in, uh, on this issue in the case, the Second Circuit agreed, and it made uh, basically two key holdings that are now before the Supreme Court. So first, the Second Circuit found that Goldman had the burden of persuasion, not just the burden of production, when attempting to rebut this basic presumption. Right? The difference there being that means that Goldman had to actually show by a preponderance of evidence that it was correct, uh, not just produce some evidence and then turn it over to the plaintiffs. And then second, uh, the Second Circuit found that it did not have to consider the generic nature of the alleged misstatements in assessing the existence of price impact. It said it didn't have to do that because the issue in its view was too closely related to the substantive issue of whether the statements were material or not. Um, so basically what the Second Circuit ended up doing here is saying that if you show the elements of the basic presumption, it's an efficient market, et cetera, 
then the court can presume price impact without analyzing whether the statements at issue or the type of statements that would, pre that would prevent a stock price from dropping or cause any movement in it at all. So that's a long wind up. I know a lot of information and a long wind up to get to why the Goldman case is significant, but here we go. So without the ability to effectively challenge this price maintenance theory, hey, Lyle, remember Lyle. this is a just to pause for a second, um, I know you do a lot of SEC work. How do you think this is being teed up as an appellate matter, given your expertise? I mean, do you find that it's really not what's motivating the, the argument? Do you think it, the words have captured it? Because that must be so distilled and uh, a bit frustrating from your angle, or are you just kind of happy with the way it's being argued? Is that, is that clear enough? You know what I'm saying? Like, like a lot of your issues have been very condensed in this setting. And do you feel like it's working or is it really just frustrating and kind of a waste of time? Uh, the case as a whole, do you mean, Mark? Yeah, just the process. I'm just curious because I think in your setting, it often becomes frustrating that, that words become not what you're used to the meaning or like the basic case that you mentioned and you've lived with for so long. Is it not being properly understood in the real world? I'm just trying to capture the difference between this very, you know, very condensed setting and then the way it works in practice. Sure. So there is definitely a lot of talk out there about whether or not the basic presumption, right, this kind of this this underlying pinning of all securities class actions works or not. And there was a case in the Supreme Court, the Halliburton II case, in which that was raised with the court as to whether or not, the you know, there is now a lot of evidence that markets don't really work in the way that the basic presumption assumes, that there isn't this kind of... Um, um, very efficient market that's always processing all the information and all the information is incorporated into the stock price basically immediately. Right. Is that really true? Right. And so in Halliburton II, um, that was challenged. There was a ton of uh, amicus support to have the Supreme Court look at that. And the Supreme Court basically passed. So we had two justices that in a dissent, um, Thomas and Alito said, yeah, it looks like maybe this efficient capital market hypothesis doesn't really work anymore. The the science behind it has moved on since we did this basic decision, you know, all these years ago. Um, but the rest of the court um, gave it a pass. Now, the court does have, obviously, three new members since then. Um, whether that might make a difference if this issue gets uh, teed up again before the court, hard to say. Um, but there, there really was an attempt to kind of say, what basic said doesn't really hold anymore. Um, but wasn't successful. So we are left kind of with this, um, you know, these, these nuances, right, important nuances about, okay, we, got, we have to live with this and we have to show price impact. What, you know, what is that? How do we do it? Um, I'm sorry, good. No, no. So if, uh, I was just going to say, so, you know, why then is this case significant, right? So what, what is it, why, why does it matter? And I know this has been, it, it's seen, it seemed probably to this point very technical, but it, it does matter and here's why. So if you can't challenge the price maintenance theory at the class certification stage, then basically getting certified for any kind of event-driven securities class action like this one really becomes a fait accompli. I mean, here is kind of the, how this will go in, in sort of three very easy steps if you're a, if you're a securities plaintiff. The one, you identify a stock price drop based on an external bad news about the company, right? Um, and we've just talked about these, you know, the types of things that that could be sexual harassment allegations or an SEC investigation or anything like that. Two, you work your way back and you find some generic statements that are about the same general subject matter, uh, conflicts of interest, company's honesty, et cetera. And then three, you invoke the price maintenance theory and you say, I don't have to show that there was really any movement in stock price. All I have to do is basically say that these generic statements prevented the stock price from dropping because look, when this bad news came out later, the stock price did drop. So voila, you sort of have class certification in three simple steps with the defendant really having little to no ability to rebut this basic presumption, even though in Halliburton II, the court said, Defendants do have the ability to rebut it, and that's that's part of the whole class certification process. So our amicus brief brought up the, the the validity of the inflation maintenance theory, and, and without getting too deep into the weeds of, of that, do you think that there, there's a chance the court might consider that? 
I don't think so, although it's certainly possible, right? So, so Goldman in its briefing was very careful to basically not challenge the under that that concept, the concept that there can be a price impact based on statements that are maintaining the price as opposed to actually moving the price up or down. Um, and um, there is a circuit split on that issue, by the way. So there is a, a sort of narrow circuit split with the uh, seventh, second, and eleventh circuits all saying price maintenance theory works, uh, and actually the fifth and eighth circuits basically saying when you say price impact, it really has to mean the price moves, not just that it stays the same. So, but I think this case basically preserves that issue for another case um, that's going to directly focus on it because, and and that's not too surprising because the second circuit didn't endorse this theory for the first time in the Goldman case. It had been endorsed in previous cases. Um, and so it was not teed up as kind of an issue of first impression here for the Second Circuit. But as I just described, so we've got five circuits that have said something about it. That means there's a lot of circuits still left out there for someone to come in, tee that up, and then you know potentially go to, go to the court with it. Um, so um, just to kind of wrap up, uh, what's the court likely to do in Goldman? So I think that reading the tea leaves, um, it seems like a safe bet the court is going to find actually that the Second Circuit was wrong not to consider all of the evidence related to price impact, including the generic nature of the alleged misstatements. But how significant that holding will be really I think is going to depend on two other uh, potential rulings the court could make. So first, Will the court say anything about what it views as the significance of generic or aspirational misstatements in assessing price impact? So is the court going to say something like, look, if you've got a statement about your, your general statement about your honesty, ah, hard to believe that really has any kind of price impact. If it goes that far, if it makes a statement like that, it's obviously going to get a lot more guidance to lower courts on how to, how to think about evidence like that when it's, when it's thinking about price impact. And then second, there's this issue about burden of persuasion or burden of production. So I think that's actually quite a close question. Um, and if the court finds that defendants have the burden of persuasion, uh, you know, that's obviously going to dilute the benefit to defendants of a ruling that all this evidence has to be uh, considered because it will, it will make it harder. Um, so look, the court is often cautious on the topic of securities class uh, you know, litigation and those issues. And I think it tends to issue narrow decisions in this area. Um, but it has heard a number of cases about the basic presumption. We've talked, you know, I've talked some about them today, but really this is about the fourth one um, on this general topic, um, which is narrow, but important. And so it's going to be interesting to see if the court's inclined to issue something more sweeping so as to not see some more cases. I thought that was terrific, Lyle, and I'll just uh, uh, say that I want to add an asterisk to what I said, because when I think about class actions, often securities class actions, even though like enormously important, are they're, they're almost like a separate category to me. I think of them more as securities cases than class actions, but that may be just the way that that uh, litigators divide up the cases at the law firm and not, you know, but, but class actions writ large, securities class actions are a huge deal in, in this case, for the reasons you've said. Uh, compellingly is a huge deal. Mark, anything else question-wise for, for Lyle in this case? Okay, so I guess we'll, we'll move on um, in addition to the cases that are already being discussed. Uh, two more pretty big cases to be argued in the month of March alone, both of which uh, Mark was counsel of record on amicus briefs in. So I guess I'll throw it over to you, Mark, to talk about the Arthex case. Why did the Supreme Court take that case? So let me let me circle back to let me frame it and then I'll I'll, okay. I'll, I'll answer why I'll, I'll have you know have some hypotheses but obviously it's a bit of a mystery but what's so great about the presentation so far and, and your contributions Glenn is it really getting at motivations of the ju judges and really core issues of what creates law as opposed to just focusing on on textbooks We're talking about motivation and in the case I'm going to talk about is United States with Arthrex. And I think to start with the Constitution, I mean, that's obviously a big deal at the Supreme Court and just getting stepping back. And there are two provisions that are in play here. There's Article 1, which gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science. You know, that's the patent provision. And then Article 2, pre President nominates and Senate consents to officers of the United States. So you have the patent bar, which is motivated by Article 1. It quotes it all the time. And then you have ad law and this, you know, this officer issue, which is also 
popular and you have these two provisions coming together. And so what I'm gonna talk about is set up the case and then inside baseball that Glenn was just asking and then a little bit on the amicus, amicus participation. So on the federal circuit opinion, uh, just to condense it a little bit, the process is called interpartis review, IPR, um, like, like class actions, like SEC, Panbar definitely has its own language and IPR is, is a very popular word. It's a procedure that was enacted in 2001. Uh, anyone now can petition for review of a patent. And if the director thinks it makes sense, the director of the patent office thinks it makes sense, then the board will consider arguments on both sides, whether this is a, uh, a valid patent or not, and issue a decision. That decision gets appealed to the federal circuit. Very popular proceedings, uh, looked at some stats, 11,000 petitions. Um, since 2011. So what's going on here is Arthrex has a patent on a medical device. They sued Smith and Nephew. And Smith and Nephew said, well, we'll, do, we'll use this IPR process. And the board agreed that the patent should not have issued. And then it goes up to the federal circuit. So far, nothing particularly unusual. It's happened many, many, many times, perhaps too many for the federal circuit. But what happens now is the federal circuit says that IPR system is unconstitutional. So it's kind of like, whoa, this system that's been around since 2011 that is doing so many um, decisions is all of a sudden unconstitutional. And how does the federal circuit get there? Uh, three parts. First, they say that Edmund, which is a Supreme Court decision involving military judges in the Coast Guard criminal appeals process, the Edmund case controls. Then they say, we're gonna look and we're gonna apply Edmund to the IPR system doesn't satisfy the test as laid out in Edmund. And then the court says, to fix that problem, we're just gonna slice a little bit out of the IPR system that we think is causing the problem and so it's valid. So I can do it, I'll do it again with just a little more, a little more uh, content. Edmunds, okay, that's on point. It's really the only Supreme Court case. Under Edmunds, the problem is that the review, the board's decision is the final decision. Nobody's looking, there's no director, nobody's looking at it. Board decision comes out right up to the federal circuit. So it's the board is deciding what to do. And the, there is some supervision by the director, but there's no authority of the director to remove. And so to frame it more precisely, the question is whether these patent judges who are sitting on the board that's making the decisions, are they officers under that provision I started out? If they're officers, they need Senate consent. There's no Senate consent. So that's the unconstitutional problem. So, so just to step back a bit, I'll go back to the, uh, the uh, provision and the constitution. The president nominates Senate consents to officers of the United States. If I'm an ALJ sitting on this board, am I an officer of the United States? Well, I wasn't confirmed, but if I'm doing the sorts of things that Edmund says it makes me an officer of the United States, but if I'm not, reviewed by, by anybody else who has been confirmed, if I'm issuing important decisions without much supervision, if there's no review of what I'm doing, then I'm, I'm acting as an officer. I should, be, I should have been Senate confirmed, but I'm not. And so what the federal circuit then does is say, well, you know what we can do? We can take out the part of the statute concerning tenure. We'll take away the tenure of these officials. Now the director can fire anybody and they say that makes a difference. And so now we're gonna be inferior officers, not a problem. So that is, that's the basic structure of what happened. It was deeply unsettling to the patent bar. There was certainly some dissents when it tried to go in bank. There were four out of 12 thought it got it wrong. And so that's the stage for Glenn. And now your question, <laughs> Glenn's question is, well, why did the Supreme Court take the case? Not to speak for you, Glenn, but that is, that is the question you asked. And you could start with that kind of the obvious, which is well, the Solicitor General said, Supreme Court, take the case. Um, the, uh, once the Solicitor General files a petition saying take the case, the odds are about 80% it's gonna get taken. Uh, why did the SGC say take the case? Well, you invalidate the act of Congress, right? You, the Federal Circuit is saying the statute's no good. Uh, the SG says, well, it's like a circuit split, which is often the, what causes the Supreme Court to take the case. You have divided federal circuit opinions. It's only gonna to go to the federal circuit because it's a patent case. So it's basically a circuit split and it's really important. You have all these board decisions that all of a sudden, are, the, the, what, what happens now, what are the next steps? So those are the three reasons the SD gave. But I wanna float a couple more. And there was a recent study that actually what goes on is if a Supreme Court case is central to a decision, 
and they're not happy with the way that court is that case is being used, your odds go really up in terms of getting a grant. And so Edmund being so central to the papers, I think really may well have contributed to the grant. It all could have been very similar, but with Edmund's, and just to make a little bit of a joke of it, I went to the table of contents of the SG's brief to see how often Edmund was cited. And of course, predictably, uh, and, you know, so it's just central. And then there was a recent 29 opinion on a similar issue in the CIA. Uh, so it, and then you have your really top um, Supreme Court counsel on the papers. And so there's a lot going on. And so the question we start with the SG petition, is that causing it or is it really just reflecting, you know, it's the whole causation correlation um, dilemma, like really what's causing it or is it really just tracking what was gonna happen anyway? And then on, on the amicus filings, there were a lot of the two active um, bars. You know, you've got the patent bar and you've got the appellate bar. Uh, I counted 28 amicus briefs. It's a decent amount, 14 on one side, 12 on the other, and, and four on neither. And what we did one for Apple, and I just was quickly run through the three, the three points that we made. And the first and is, and, I, and, just, and this is just to state what matters, if you're filing an amicus brief, you have to have credibility. Otherwise, you're not you're not advancing the ball. And when you you know, so you start out by saying, well, Apple, it's used the IPR system a lot. Like it, it yes, it has events, it creates pens, it has pens, very important. I'm using one right now, probably. Um, on the other hand, it um it uses the IPR system. It uses it 200 times. Sometimes it wins, or sometimes it loses, but the system is working for Apple. And so we have credibility when we're talking about the system. And then we say, look, Congress has created a reliable and efficient system. And I like numbers, I like stats. And on page 13 of our brief, what I, the stat that really gets to me is 46% of the time, the district courts will hold that a patent is invalid. And if you go through the IPR system, it's 46% of the time. And so now you have a, an administrative process that's cheaper and quicker, really getting to the same set of results that the district court litigation is getting to. And so it, it is working. Um, so that was our, so we have credibility. We say, we do think the system is working. And then we say, look, if you're gonna rule it unconstitutional, if you're gonna change it, please make it minimally disruptive as possible. Issue a stay, you know, let Congress do it, but please don't cause chaos. And so those were our three points. And we filed it in support of neither party because we don't have a particular issue with this result. What we were saying is, look, we know what we're talking about. <laughs> Congress did pretty well. <laughs> Please don't cause chaos. And that was our amicus, that was our amicus um, um, setting. And that one more reflection, and then I'll pause. The, you know, I think you've been asking, what is the prediction? Like, what's going to happen? It's really hard to know. Um, but I will say this. If they affirm on the unconstitutional part and then affirm on the remedy part, I think it is gonna to lead to an enhanced view of the federal circuit. The federal circuit has at times struggled at the Supreme Court level, uh, this is smiling. Um, but I do think this was quite a, you know, if, if they're right on both scores and they may, you know, you could see the arguments. If they're right on both scores, I do think that it's gonna help their rep um, in terms of getting such a complex issue um, correct in, in, the, in the Supreme Court's views. So I'll pause and bring it, bring it. <laughs> Archie, Lyle, any questions for, for Mark on Arthex? So these, these were actually the pieces that tied together, correct? Or did they both offer the same question? Or or because uh, one was Smith and Nephew, if I recall correctly. Yeah, there's not really much meaningful difference. Uh, it, the, the, the dispute was really over forfeiture, over whether the issues were raised at the right time in the Supreme Court appropriately. I don't think really was bothered with that. Well, you know, and I'd love to hear Mark talk more about this, but, you know, one thing that has struck me as interesting, and I, I can't tell if maybe it's 10, 15, 20 years is, is the time frame, but uh, it feels like there is almost a specialized uh, Supreme Court bar of getting uh, review of or defense of the federal circuit's decisions, uh, you know, in the IP context. And, and you know, I, that's why I smiled when, when you said what you said. I, I think it is an interesting practice, because, both because of its importance to the economy and uh, and because I guess there is this one court that, uh, you know, if it's if it's wrong, there's only one place to go, so to speak. But I, I'd be interested in your comments on that. I know that's a big part of what you do. 
Yeah, no, I think it's it's a real pull, push and pull, I think, at the federal circuit. Because on the one hand, it's patents. It sounds really technical. It's talking about technology. Um, and it's important that it be almost its own space, that it's not the second circuit. It's not the ninth circuit. It's its own space. And that's kind of why it was made. On the other hand, as we were talking with Lyle, like language matters is only the English language that we use in these cases. And so it can become so technical that it's repeating the very problem <laughs> that it's tr we're trying to avoid. And so there's a bit of a yin and a yang. And I think right now you could say, well, it's getting a little more technical. Um, and actually that I think the Supreme Court does want to step in because they are generalists. They want to make the copyright and the trademark and the pen. They want harmony between them. Um, and so if it gets too technical, um, that then, then they start hopefully engaging. So it, it, it's a very, it's one of these multi-factor tests that, pro that can drive some people crazy, engineers perhaps. Um, but but it, it's not, there's not like a yes or no. So as, as often happens in patent cases, there were some, some uh, sort of strange bedfellows that were together on one side and, and, and certainly on the other as well. Um, and it certainly reflects the way that different types of industries look at patent law. Uh, cases. Is that a fair assessment of sort of, of, of the way that we laid out? I think, I think so. Um, it, some people have more at stake on one side of these than at the other. Um, and, you know, my client Apple considers itself in the middle, but if you're not inventing and you're only getting sued all the time, that's going to put you in one. Um, and if, if you, you know, never get sued, that puts you in another. So there's lots of different issues at play. And that's why it's fun to have the Supreme Court engage on it, because it, it's much more sheltered um, from, from that, those dynamics. So if we can move on to the NCAA case, which which probably is the one case that will get on ESPN this year, which is, is um, <laughs> more interesting, and it, it sort of arises in a, in a pretty huge uh, debate over uh, whether or not NCAA players should be able to take advantage of their likeness and names, et cetera, or that there, there should be pay. But this is a rule of reason case at its at its core, I, uh, at least that, that's what it seems like. So we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this, uh, this, uh, very, very briefly, but the core rule that, that we're worrying about is whether athletes must not be paid. And just, to, just to, we do drop a footnote saying, look, how it works if your image is used in a video game, that's not what this case is about. Um, this is a case about the Ninth Circuit saying that uh, NCAA rules limiting payments, quote, related to education are antitrust violations. But the way they define, quote, related to education um, includes, for example, highly paid internships. And so they've really kind of gutted the rule that limits payments. And so the NCAA is unhappy with that outcome because they're very sensitive to it. The rules have modified over time. There's legislatures looking at what to do, but it's not an antitrust issue. It's something that the NCA needs to work out with the players. Um, and so what we did, and, and just to describe it, is we found 18 former student athletes, all NCAA Division I. And let me just read out the sports we had. We had basketball, gym, football, soccer, swimming, golf, rowing, volleyball, track and field. Um, some of them were played in, in the professional leagues. We have a bunch of Olympians. Um, and we, we wanted, what they wanted to do, and it was not hard to find them, was to, was to just inform the court what is life like at college and CAA. And that's like a great role for an amicus brief, right? We don't do much on the law. We're just, what is going on? And so we quote, we quote, we have some great quotes about their leadership, um, and this is on page 11, quote, chase athletic dreams while pursuing a degree. And that, that's from somebody who was living this life. Um, and so they talk about leadership, the skills they learned um, both in the sport and being in an uh, academic setting. And the phrase we keep using is, quote, a tradition of amateurism. And that is really what's at risk, a tradition of amateurism. If basically everybody's gonna, not everybody, and that's another great, another point I really enjoyed learning, is very few of the NCAA athletes in college have the option of getting paid, even if you would eliminate all these rules. It's maybe the top schools, the top players in basketball and football at the very top schools. And what happens if you allow that, we call it a compensation arms race, where all the schools, money has to go over there. So what happens? Well, the volleyball team gets cut. What happens? The uh, track and field can't do as many competitions. And so that's what they also, athletes were laying out, the risk of losing so many um, alternatives to the very few that where this is an issue. And so that was 
that was the brief we found. Okay. I found the the Mika's brief of the state of Georgia quite interesting. Um, is do you think that their perspective there about this is something that courts shouldn't even be getting involved in? This is should be left to the legislature. Is that going to resonate with any of the justices? You think? Yeah, I think um, as, as we've been talking about the the author of the amicus brief can really affect the persuasiveness of the amicus brief. And so if athletes say, well, it's something legislators should do, you know, it's fine, but it's not great. Uh, if a legislature like Georgia comes in and says, this is something we know how to handle, let it deal, I think that is, that is very helpful. And obviously it raises a lot of federalism questions and state and the role of antitrust law and where, where a court should fit in. And there's definitely some justices who will have an interest there. Um, but it's been a while. 1984 was the last time the Supreme Court heard college courts. And right. so predicting exactly who's going to go where is, I mean, we can, you know, predict, but I wouldn't, you know, bet on it. Our Chase Lyle, any questions for Mark on either one of those cases? No, I, I, I laughed at the, at the betting. Uh, I, it's uh, <laughs> totally apropos. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have guesses uh, as to which justices will be the most interested in, in this. And I, I, I also would guess that a lot of it will have very little to do with the, the law and a lot to do with the facts. I think that's the conversation today. I mean, the generic, we're, we're honest, you know, the, 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 the credit card you were relating to. I mean, a lot of law is driven, in fact, by things that are just in the case as opposed to what the statute says, um, and then you can work backwards. And so I think as litigated, so long as we're aware of that and not, oh, not over rely on either one, but it, it is helpful, I think, for us to talk about. Right. And no former NCAA football players on the court like like Byron White to, to <laughs> weigh there. <laughs> we have, we, we, exactly, no, we have a line on that. He nearly, he was a runner up for Heisman. Um, <laughs> That's right. And so, was, and, so was, and so was one of our, 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 our clients. And so we linked the two of them. So one of the things that, that, that I think you wanted to talk about in the beginning when, when we were having some, some vid, uh, audio issues is the oral argument style and how the doing it telephonically has, has affected um, arguments and also cases themselves. Your, your firm argued on behalf of Oracle in the Google versus Oracle case, which was argued on the third day of the term. And there had already been telephonic uh, questioning before that. But can you give us some thoughts on, on uh, sort of how, how that's had an impact? Yeah, happy to. Um, so in getting ready, I actually pulled up the transcript of that argument you mentioned, and I searched for the word thank you uh, 56 times, <laughs> the word thank you. Uh, and I did it on the, the DACA case where we also filed a brief, and it's 22 times. And now that's totally anecdotal. Some statistics may not be right, but I think it's become much more formal because now you have two minutes. Chief Justice passes on two minutes. Chief Justice. Um, and so when you read the transcript, it's kind of smooth. When you listen to it, it, it there's a lot of interruptions and a, a lot, a lot of um, just difficult navigating this new process. And so I thought it would be useful just to think a little bit about the impact that's having. Um, people should chime in, but there's upsides and there's downsides. And then there's a the question of, is it gonna matter? So on the upsides, I find it a very direct conversation because for a couple of minutes, you have counsel, one particular justice talking things through. And that's great because I think you get the chance of a follow-up of a follow-up. It's almost more like an appellate argument where often in the Supreme Court, there's nine justices and you have one answer, two answers, and then it kind of moves on. You do have, I think, more of a sustained conversation, which I think can be really useful. I mean, they all participate, and Justice Thomas most obviously, but I think that's really great um, that, that everybody should, I think just people, some people feel more comfortable when they're actually at their time to talk. That doesn't necessarily correlate with who has good questions, who's right, who's persuasive, who we should listen to. And I think sort of eliminating that, I think, is really helpful. And I do think there's some advantage of just hearing the voice. It really does make you concentrate on what someone is saying. Um, and so those are real upsides, um, very, very real. There are definitely downsides. Um, so one of them is the topics shift a lot. You could have two minutes on topic X, and then it's the next justice, and then it's topic Y and topic Z. Well, in the live setting, I think it's much more sustained on the same topic. Uh, it's almost like, you know, having a debate with a friend versus having like a family dinner conversation. And there's pros and cons, but it, it's not the same and it's a shift. The one that a lot of people talk about is the lack of the nonverbal cues. You can't see who's smirking, <laughs> who, who's not paying attention, who's writing a note to a colleague, um, and who's wrapped. 
and and because you're just listening to one person and so that's a big difference in terms of understanding where you should go with an advocate because sometimes the person you're looking to you can tell the person two or three over is really paying attention and that just should matter versus not it there's a lot going on that you miss and that's such a big change and there's a little bit of games playing i think now with the two minutes where you could say the, the question could be almost so what do you have to say and so now I get two minutes to, to sell my affirmative point that you already agree with. Um, and so, so there's, there's a little bit of that, I think, going on. Um, you know, in terms of will it matter, you know, for one, there's the question of how much arguments ever matter. So that's just, that's just the same. Um, but I found a quote, and if you excuse the language, from a member of Congress a little, a little while back, um, quote, I'll let you write the substance of a statute and you, you let me write the procedure and I'll screw you every time. <laughs> and so I, I do think procedure has an impact. It's affecting the conversation. It's, re, it's really a big change. Um, and I'm already seeing some studies come out. I, I do think it's gonna matter, um, but that, that'd be too soon to tell, obviously. Archie, Slyle, anything to add to that? The only comment I have is that for people who have been listening to you watching the court for a long time, it, it is, you know, after years of not hearing Justice Thomas, uh, you know, this this uh, setup has has uh, caused him to ask questions in every argument. And so so it's uh, at least as a watcher of the court, you know, uh, more information that, that I think we didn't have for years. I would just throw a question out to the two of you, which is to say, what do you think the chances are this lasts beyond COVID? In other words, if we get back to live arguments, are we just, is it automatically gonna go back to the way it was or is there some possibility some of this might, new procedure might get incorporated? Well, I, I'll, I'll say I, I bet that they they want to return to it because uh, you know unlike other courts where maybe it makes more sense, there is something to being in the Supreme Court courtroom that I think matters for the broader system. That that's just my my view. I mean, it's obviously up to the justices, uh, but but my guess is that 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 public function will will cause a return to the courtroom when it's safe to do so. And so. I agree with, with that, uh, but uh, I feel like your question is a deeper question than just this one topic. I mean, even what we're doing today is not what we were doing <laughs> pre-pandemic. And I, I do think a lot of what we're learning is gonna continue. It may be different form. Um, and I do, th my guess is when the justices go back to the, the system, they're gonna have learned from this, you know, whether it's not to interrupt or to interrupt more, or whether it's to figure out a way to get Justice Thomas to feel like he should engage. I don't know exactly, but I feel like this has been a real learning experience. And I don't think the lesson, I, I doubt it goes back to as it was, just in so many parts of our lives. So Lyle, I wanna give you a chance to, uh, to chime in on, on uh, if there are any other securities oriented cases that are working it's their, their way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, obviously we wouldn't be hearing them this term, but uh, is, is there anything that people that are interested in this area should be keeping an eye out for? So I, I think there are two, to me, I mean, there could be many more, of course, but I think there are a couple that seem possible. And one is, um, uh, actually relates in some ways to a case that the, that the Supreme Court just uh, heard, which is the Federal Republic of Germany versus Philip, which is this uh, Nazi art uh, case that was just in the news. And, and that case is about the extraterritorial application of the U.S. laws, essentially. That is an issue in securities as well. Uh, and a few years ago, the Supreme Court basically said you can't have a foreign purchaser of a foreign stock on a foreign exchange come in and sue in the United States. But there is still a lot of room that that leaves because there are a lot of foreign securities that are traded in the U.S., but nevertheless are really foreign securities. And that is an issue that the Second and the Ninth Circuit uh, seem a little bit at odds about. And there, uh, uh, there is certainly uh, in, in cases called Toshiba in the Ninth Circuit and Park Central in the Second Circuit. And so there's certainly some room there, I think, um, for the Supreme Court to take a look at that coming up. And the other area I would probably flag is um, is actually loss causation, which is an area that the Supreme Court has not looked at since uh, 2006, I believe, in the Dura case, um, but is uh, percolating, especially uh, on issues about what does a plaintiff need to plead to show loss causation and get past a motion to dismiss? Um, the Ninth Circuit has issued a string of decisions actually just this past year 
some of which frankly conflict with each other, but definitely conflict with other circuits uh, on this topic. And so I think that's another one that we could uh, we could see some CERT activity uh, all around as well. There's another case in the Second Circuit, actually the Banco Safra case that uh, the, that hasn't been decided yet. It's a it's a cubed case that the WL filed an amicus brief in. So that's another chance so that if that comes down, that might head up to the Supreme Court as well on that issue. Absolutely. Well, it looks like it appears to be the witching hour. So uh, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today and for all, all of your, your wonderful insights. Uh, this program, as I said before, is recorded. So if anybody came in late or knows of anybody that wants to watch it, it'll be on our website probably later on today. Uh, gentlemen, thanks again for, for uh, your time and your, your insights and uh, hope you have a good rest of the week. Thanks for having us. <laughs>